Very quickly, I'm going to tell you a story of a little place in Mississippi. It's called Tupelo, Mississippi. I told the story this morning that what I did, uh, I'm very serious about community development. I mean, I'm absolutely passionate about it. And uh, I have little patience with people who let their tail and go to hell and then blame somebody else. I have no patience at all with them. Uh, so I'm very passionate about moving things forward, and, and I'm, I'm very impatient about getting things done. Uh, but I know it takes years. At any rate, what I wanted to do, I had studied at, some good, at a good university, but I still didn't know how good communities came about. And so what I did was to write every economic development part department in the United States, in every state, every state. So I wrote from California to Oregon to Washington to Colorado with a request. Would you recommend or nominate two communities from your state that have done extraordinary well with limited resources. Did you give me two names? And they were all very kind. They all gave me uh, names. Some states only gave me one. They said, the, the best one we've got is so good, we can't even think of a second best one. And so I wound up with 91 cases that I could work with. And, and, I, and I went through and I spent a year and a half looking to decide which places I would study. And I, I never dreamed I'd be studying a Mississippi community. I never dreamed that. Uh, in fact, I, I told this, this is true. I went over to see a friend of mine who happens to be African American in Tupelo, Mississippi. And I said, you know, Amos, I've been working on this project for a year and a half. I've been all over the United States. I've looked at all 91 of the communities that were recommended collected lots of data, uh, and I said, they're all great. But I said the community that consistently stays with me is this Tupelo, Mississippi. It just stays with me. And I said, I can't write about a Mississippi town. I'll lose all credibility. And, and he said, Vaughn, and he put his arm around me. He said, Vaughn, listen, if it can be done in Mississippi, it can be done anywhere. He said, God's given you a gift. And he said, I got a title for your book. And I said, what is it? And he said, can any good come out of Nazareth? He said, that's what they said of Jesus. He couldn't be a prophet. He's from Nazareth. So the working title of my book was, can any good come out of Nazareth? And all the editors and the people that handled it said, what the hell does this mean? <laughs> so... They suggested you drop the title, so I did, and came up with a very unimaginative title uh, called Tupelo, the Evolution of a Community. Then I've written a second book about it. It was so intriguing, called Hand in Hand, and, and I'd recommend them as, as useful to you. Let's, let's show you what, what attracted me to Tupelo. In 1940, Lee County, Mississippi, that's where Tupelo is located, 1940, Lee County was arguably the poorest county in the United States. I asked this question at lunch, and, and somebody knew the answer. I'll ask it again. What does the average family, the average family, earn in a year in the United States? Keeping in mind the average family in the United States has two breadwinners. So in 2009, how much does the average family make in a year? What's the average? 45, 46,000. You were there, and so you already knew the correct answer. Don't answer this next question. I asked the question, what do you suppose the average family in, in Tupelo and Lee County, Mississippi, made in 1940? I used 1940 as my base data. $700. This man's read the book. In a year. They were uneducated. Half the population is functionally illiterate. They were divided. So they're poor, they're uneducated, and they're divided. Seven hundred less than seven hundred and fifty dollars a year. Half the population functionally illiterate and divided. Let's fast forward to two thousand and nine. In two in nineteen forty is a population of, of eight thousand. 
Fast, flash following now, the population is 34,000. They have 51,000 jobs. They're not low paying jobs. In the last 30 years, their economy has outgrown the national economy. In one of the most prosperous periods of the United States. The poorest county and the poorest state in the United States has done that. During one stretch, they added an average of 1,000 new industrial jobs for 19 consecutive years. Not too shabby. They have been cited as the model for economic development by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the model for economic development by the Chamber of Commerce, the model for economic development by the Federal Reserve Bank out of Atlanta. They have won, they, they were the first southern town to be named an all-American city which is given to 10 cities a year. They became the only city in the United States to win it twice. They're the only city in the United States to win it three times. And they will win a fourth. They're good. They're real good. Their in average in income now has finally reached the national average. You've got, you got hundreds of communities in California it's richer than they are by far. But they're now up to about 46,000. They have 45 international corporations, 17, no, 18 Fortune 500 companies. They're doing pretty good. Educationally wise, they now are the best, they're the top school system in the state by far. My university recruits there harder than any other town in the state of Mississippi. They spend more money on education than any other town, by far, by far. Harvard and the Ford Foundation gave them the award as one of the 10 best private, public private partnerships in education in the United States. One of the 10 best. They give lots of money. Now, Mississippi badly underfunds its schools. The citizens in Tupelo know that. So what they do is they put in private funds, a lot of private funds. One man gave four and a half million. And that was 20 years ago. You can figure what it would be worth now. They put in a lot of money. And it's a good school system. No question about it. I didn't mention their health care, because in 1940 they didn't really have much of a health care. I told this story also at lunch. The medical center is the largest employer in the town, oh, and some of you know the answer to this, so I'll ask you to keep quiet for just a moment. Uh, medical center is the largest employer, a town of 34,000. How many people work in the medical center? What's the answer? How many do you think? Pardon? Six or seven hundred? Six thousand six hundred. It is the second largest employer in the state of Mississippi. Only Ingalls Shipyard on the Gulf Coast is larger. You know how that medical center got there? They put it there. Their money. They put it there. It generates over $800 million a year, which gets fed back into the community, besides giving some of the best health care going. U.S. News cited it as one of the four model hospitals in the United States, alongside with Mayo Clinic, Massachusetts, and a little lonely Tupelo. And they built it. They built it. They have a branch of the University of Mississippi, which is the only place to have one. I asked the question, how much did the state of Mississippi put up to get that branch? You know the answer? Zero. The local people raised the money and put it there. They were branch of, of, they wanted the University of Mississippi because we have the medical school. They reached out to Mississippi University of Women because it has the, the nursing school. Why do they want those two? Why was that important to get them? Who's going to train 6,600 workers? Right? So 
they had to create the infrastructure that led to 6,600. Now, how in the world did they, did they do that? This was an agricultural area. And their soil was worn out. Local people went to, can we flash this model back up there? Local people went to the best schools of agriculture in the United States. They started at Cornell. And I don't know if you could guess why they started at Cornell. They started at Cornell because George McLean knew somebody at Cornell. I'm a mentor. So they started at Cornell and said, who's, who's doing something that would help farmers directly? And George McLean would tell this story. He said, what I did, every place I went, I, I'd go into these college professors and I'd say, how do you raise the income level of poor people? And do it directly. Don't give me any of this stuff about trickle-down theory. Because a trickle-down theory is a lot like getting urinated on. <laughs> I never met anybody who was rich who didn't trickle down what they wanted to trickle down and hold what they didn't. <laughs> then he challenged the guy. He said, if you don't know how to tell us how to get poor people wealthier in agriculture, you ought to get out of teaching because you're not doing anybody any good. All you're doing is drawing a salary. It's a pretty good challenge. One of the professors at Wisconsin said, you need to get into dairy. You need to get into dairy. Because what you will do, you will you'll grow crimson clover in your soil. You'll begin to revitalize it. The cattle will fertilize it. You'll have a day, daily and a weekly income. Well, how do we do that? You have to have good stock. Where do we get good? How much is good stock going to cost us? Now, I have to kind of caution you here. I was telling a group today, I was in Lexington, Kentucky last year, when a horse, which had never won a race, had never won a race and sold for $11.2 million. So you've got to get that fixed in your head. You're trying to get a champion bull. And so he said it'll cost you several million. Oh, my gosh, George McClay said. Several million is only one man in in all of Lee County that can afford that. And I called him a Nazi in a front page editorial <laughs> just last month, so he's probably not going to want to contribute. That would be a safe bet. Well, I challenged the group this morning. One of the things that George McLean did better than anybody was that he would sit in a chair every Wednesday morning in his, in his living room, actually, straight chair with a cup of coffee and a piece of toast, and stacks of papers and magazines. And he was looking for ideas, looking for ideas. He did that every Wednesday from 6 a.m. till 9 a.m. And everybody that worked for him wanted to do the same. Somebody needs to do that in, in Merced. Y'all could get on with that too. Find ideas. Find somebody who needs that air. Find somebody who's doing So you don't have to invent these things. He found a fellow who was experimenting in artificial insemination. Now, he called him. Would you come, and how much will it cost? He says, the guy at Wisconsin's right. I mean, you're going to have to be in this for at least five years. I mean, you, not, we're not talking about a one-year expenditure. This is going to cost you close to $10 million in today's currency, $10 million, in the poorest community in the United States. You're going to try to get artificial insemination, build up a dairy herd, and move forward. Where are you going to get the 10 million? That question's in your camp. Where are you going to get it? And if you say write a grant, you've got to get up and walk out of here. <laughs> Local people. 17 merchants went down to the Citizen Bank and mortgaged their businesses and their houses to raise that money. You will not get extraordinary results without extraordinary means. You will not. Guaranteed. They got the fellow to come down to do the artificial insemination. Can you imagine trying to talk a North Mississippi farmer into doing artificial insemination with their cow? Now, you going to do what to my cow? Well, you a lonely fellow, aren't you? I mean, <laughs> you, you need to get a date. You know? <laughs> Okay. 
Gail Carr was the right person. A man who's so humble. And what he would do, he would go out to the farmers and he would pick a little 12 year old and show him how to do this. And then the adults said, oh, I can do that. I can do that. No threat at all. He got 148 farmers to agree the first year. Then he increased it. These, then these people said, you know what, thing works. That works pretty good. They told other people. Again, this is economic community development, right? Get people, and they tell other people. Finally, they got up into the thousands of people who were using artificial. And when the money began to come in, at first like a million a year, then five million, then 10 million, then 100 million. And they were regularly pulling in 100 million a year in their dairy. Now, did the merchants get their money back? Remember, they mortgaged their houses and businesses. How'd they get their money back? The customers. The customers. The trickle down came the other way, right? It went directly to the poor people, and then it went to the merchants. Here's what they did they formed a community development foundation. It's an organization right here. It was committed to community development, and they invested their money. Today, their annual budget is over $4 million. If you're a bank in Tupelo, your, your contribution is $30,000 to $50,000 a year. But for the most part, you decide what it is. I'm a member. We have 1,400 dues-paying members. We raise a lot of money. We've got a first-rate staff. Now, what that group does is to focus on projects. The project they focus on is education. Education, 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 education. They pour money in it. We passed the largest school bond issue in the history of the state of Mississippi. Nobody had ever tried it. And we did it with an 89% positive vote. 89%. Because this organization, which had people who were respected, led the whole thing. I told the group this morning that one of the citizens pounded on the table as a Tuesday night when the election results came in. He pounded on the table and he said, I can't believe I live in a town so sorry that 11% of the people voted against their children. I can't believe that. Where are these people? They voted against their children, their grandchildren. What, is, what are they thinking about? They spend a lot of money. What are those 45 international corporations 18 Fortune 500 companies doing in Tupelo, Mississippi. Why are they there? What's the answer? Educated workforce. Toyota just agreed to come and they'll open their Prius plant there in 2010. They came because we have a good educated workforce. We come back to where we started. Right back where we started. It's, it's a remarkable community. Let me leave you with this thought. Let me leave you with the ideas of Margaret Mead. Margaret Mead said, never doubt that thoughtful and concerned citizens can change the world. Never doubt, she said, that thoughtful and concerned citizens can change the world. Indeed, she said, it's the only thing that has. <laughs>